Good morning. Happy Sunday morning to you all. Um, I am Pastor Matt, and I'm glad to come to you once again uh, with another opportunity to, to bring you a portion of God's Word. We are continuing in our Sunday School Lesson series on uh, Behold, He Cometh out of the book of Revelation. Uh, this book is um, from Revelation chapter 10 uh, to Revelation chapter 22. So the, uh, the second half of uh, the book of Revelation. Today we are looking at uh, Revelation chapter 17. And if you're wondering uh, what happened to chapters 15 and 16, that's because uh, last week the, the church uh, graciously allowed me to have time off during the week. Uh, and so I uh, had recommended and, and posted a link to uh, the video for, for our church members to um, Brother Terry Parrish's video. Uh, and so I would recommend uh, looking that up for uh, Bogart Press Sunday School Lesson for Revelation uh, chapters 15 and 16, I believe, uh, speaking of the last seven vials. So today we pick up with chapter 17, which is uh, the victory of the Lamb. The victory of the Lamb. So our key verse for today is in verse 14, which says, These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. The application is the student will relate how it may appear that Satan and his forces are winning on earth, but Jesus is in control and will eventually overcome. Uh, and in our first look, just to kind of go back and do a very brief overview of the book of Revelation to see what we've covered thus far uh, we remember that uh, we've already seen the seven seals, uh, the scroll that only one was worthy to open, uh, being uh, the lamb that was slain, the lion of the tribe of Judah, Jesus Christ, that he has indeed opened the seven seals, uh, at least within our, um, our study uh, of this and all of those things that would come to pass as a result of that. Um, the seals have been open. Following the seven seals, we know about the seven trumpets, that the trumpets have sounded. Uh, and just this last lesson is that the seven vials of God's wrath have been poured out and emptied on uh, the earth. And now it is time for the last earthly empire, the last earthly kingdom to fall once and for all. And so we begin by looking at Babylon the Great, uh, according to verses 3 through 6, which says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-covered beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wonder, wondered with great admiration." some uh, pretty amazing uh, imagery, uh, very uh, blunt uh, type of language that we see uh, in this, in this uh, description here uh, of uh, Battle on the Great, uh, this, this woman that is uh, being described. Um, so, once again, when it comes to the book of Revelation and a lot of prophecy concerning things that have not yet happened, uh, there's a lot of figurative language, a lot of things that we don't fully understand as of yet because they are not happening or have not happened yet. So there are uh, places where 
the best that we can do, uh, if the Lord has not revealed them to his people, is to speculate and just keep in mind that it is a speculation. Um, but we, it is certainly important that we remember the things that are to come so that we're prepared for them to come. And we're at a time in this in the the storyline here that uh, things have never been worse on this earth. Uh, not only has the uh, Satan's forces, namely the Antichrist and the false prophet, um, not only have they brought all of their wickedness onto this earth, now you see the response of Jesus in pouring out the vials of his wrath on this earth and so you're talking about a scene that has never been seen before we think things are bad now we think things have been bad on this earth uh, as they say you ain't seen nothing yet it's gonna get way worse and so uh, the best that we can do is just to uh, be prepared and, and look for the connecting pieces it's like we don't see the whole picture quite yet but as it's revealed we'll be able to see it as it is kind of like those uh, i'm reminded of uh, the bereans who were familiar with the old testament scriptures the old testament uh, prophecies concerning jesus christ uh, but they had not known of jesus christ as the messiah yet and when I believe it was paul and silas brought um, the word of god to them they preached from the Old Testament scriptures, Jesus Christ, and they went back and studied and, and it, it uh, everything fit, all the pieces fit so that they could clearly see that Jesus Christ uh, was the Messiah that had been promised. I believe it's going to be the same way that we need to make ourselves familiar with the word of God so that as these things happen, the, everything's going to connect, the picture is going to be revealed even though we don't see it clearly uh, as of yet. But uh, the, the focus of this particular chapter is this, uh, the, the mother of harlots, Babylon the Great, as this says here. So let's kind of break this down a little bit to um, see if we can come to a better understanding of it if, if we can't completely identify um, this harlot of Babylon. First of all, there is a partnership there that we see with the beast and the Antichrist. That says that she rides on that beast, the beast we've already seen uh, described. We know uh, its description is also all the way back in the book of Daniel, um, the one with uh, seven heads, ten horns, uh, that three of the horns will be plucked out and one will be in its place. Um, you know, we, we don't understand fully what all of that symbolizes, uh, but, but we can know that this is the Antichrist. That, that the evidence is clear that it represents the Antichrist, and this is likely the um, political vessel through which the Antichrist is going to come into power, or at least that we see uh, the evidence of his power coming into being. And so, you know, if, if you're like me, you're, you're keeping an eye on different uh, political organizations throughout the world and trying to see if maybe all of these things fit. It doesn't quite yet for me, and I've heard a lot of different theories, uh, but I, I, I'm certain that uh, when the time comes that, that these things happen, it's going to be very clear if we have indeed done our, our research and study and prepared for all of this, okay? So at the very least, uh, the, this woman has partnered with the beast uh, or otherwise known as the Antichrist. And she partook of abominations and uh, filthiness as it says in in verse 4 you can see that that there are there is wealth and status and, and glory to this uh, this woman uh, whomever she may be I it's not a real woman uh, in my opinion it's it's figurative of what I would say is probably a religious organization a universal religious organization and I'll talk more about that momentarily but that this woman, whomever she may be, uh, has glory arrayed in purple and scarlet. You're talking about, um, you know, purple and scarlet are, are, are uh, symbols of wealth in the scriptures. Purple often being of loyalty. Um, 
but uh, you know that, that that this is not a destitute um, figure. This is someone with with money and donning all of those things, but at the same time, uh, uh, drinking of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, oftentimes, fornication uh, has to do not with sexual immorality, although that that very well may be the case in this instance, but in regards to a, uh, a deviation from uh, faithfulness to God. And so probably trying to keep in mind both sides of uh, that, you know, the, uh, the idea of the sexual immorality, but also the um, religious immorality in, in uh, leaving, uh, you know, leaving God, in other words. So which one it is, or maybe a combination of the both, I'm not sure, but a couple things to remember there. And of course, uh, we see in verse 5 that it talks about that uh, the mystery, uh, the name that was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abominations of, of the earth. Um, I think one of the most telling things about this woman is that she was drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And to me, this is one of the things that really brings this out to where I feel very certain um, about who this woman really is. I choose not to disclose that in a public setting um, because I, I think that it could alienate uh, people who just don't know better. And so I would just encourage you to consider the uh, description of who this harlot is and maybe form your own opinion. Um, but it's, this is one of the reasons I would suggest that it is a perhaps a religious, a universal religious organization. Uh, interestingly enough that, you know, as it says here, that her existence was a hidden thing. And we're going to talk about the hidden part. That's that word mystery uh, means just a, uh, that which is hidden. Um, okay. Oh, I didn't bring down my points here. Okay. And as I shared uh, these things here, uh, we, we then move on to the mystery of the woman, according to verses 7 through 13. Which says, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore dost thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. There's the seven heads and ten horns again. The beast that thou sawest was, and is, and is not. Or was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and into, the, into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is and here is the mind which hath wisdom the seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth and there are seven kings five are fallen and one is and the other is not yet come and when he he cometh he must continue a short space and the beast that was and is not even he is the eighth and is of the seven, and goeth into perdition. And then ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Okay, so uh, even though it's still somewhat shrouded, uh, John here by the the revealing of uh, the the image this this woman and the beast on which she rode um, be, he, he begins to clarify and obviously here speaking more of the beast than uh, than the woman but we'll get into the woman a little bit more here as well um, but uh, clearly the this mystery the hidden thing uh, was uh, clarified to John at least to the point that he can describe it as we see here there's no names given uh, we don't know what organizations or people are involved but there's just a little further clarity and it'll make it that much easier to be able to identify uh, once these figures or these characters will be revealed within the, the seven years of the tribulation 
Okay, so, uh, I, and I want to make comparisons here back to, whoops, let me go back here, uh, to what we saw in Revelation chapter 13 concerning that beast. Uh, in verses 1 through 8, it says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and tor ten horns. I think that's, that's clear that we're talking about the same figure. There's a continuity and the description remains the same. And upon his horns, ten crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the feet, uh, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world won wondered after the beast. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given in, unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. That's approximately three and a half years. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Okay, so um, this is, you can see the connection there, especially speaking of the heads and the horns. Um from Revelation chapter 13 um, in verses 1 through 8 to the connection that we hear, see here in chapter 17. Okay, we just see uh, a little more clarity concerning the beast itself in chapter 13, and chapter 17 is more concerning uh, the mystery of Babylon. Okay, uh, so the heads and the horns. He, 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 go, he clarifies in our main text that uh, the, the heads and the horns that there is a representation of um, of kings of the earth, right? He says the seven heads um, are uh, seven kings and then, or excuse me, the seven heads are seven mountains, uh, mountains of power, and I'll talk about that here in a moment. Uh, but he says the seven heads are actually eight kings, right? Seven, uh, five have been, one is, and one is yet to come. And then the beast will be the eighth uh, of those. Okay, and the ten horns are ten, uh, ten kings. When you go back and you look at um, the description of the beast from uh, from previous, uh, you find that um, that three of those horns will be plucked out and be replaced by uh, a smaller horn, which will be the uh, the antichrist. Um, this same beast, we find again, according to chapter 11, verse 7, it ascends out of the bottomless pit. And it says, And when they have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Okay, so same thing, same um, description as we, as we see here, that he ascends out of the bottomless pit. Um, now let me talk about the seven mountains for a moment. Uh, we're not told here what those seven mountains are, uh, but if you were to do a quick search uh, of um, places with seven mountains on this earth, one of the first, I mean, there's, there's many, but one of the first that comes up is the city of Rome. And if you remember, the idea of Babylon, uh, the Babylonian Empire was the first uh, great worldwide empire on this earth, at least according to what the scriptures say, going back to Daniel, right? We know that, that um, because of the wickedness of, of God's people, you know, especially uh, with the wicked king, their actions, God said, I'm, I've had enough and he allowed them to go into captivity uh, under Babylon, which was, uh, you know, the first of, of those empires that we have seen following 
Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire, following Medo-Persian was the Greek Empire, and then following that was the Roman Empire. Well, hundreds of years ago, the Roman Empire uh, came to a conclusion. But if you look at the, um, the, the book of Daniel in regard to uh, those empires, you know that there's one more empire to come, and it's represented by iron mingled with clay. Now, the Roman Empire was represented by iron, and now you have one that's iron mingled with clay. And I think that that is a representation of a revived Roman Empire. But here's the thing. This empire has been around this whole time. We just don't know it yet because, as we're going to see here in a moment, this empire has hidden among the people. Now, keep that in mind when I suggest that uh, the fact that he says here that this the seven heads are seven, uh, are seven mountains. Rome is the seven-hilled city. It, it sits on seven hills. Uh, and so I think that's a greater indication and a connection that, that Rome uh, is going to have a definite um, presence during this time. Whatever form that takes, I'm not certain. But once again, I believe that it, it never went away. So once again, without just coming right out and saying it, how might Rome have hidden itself among the people? And I'll just leave that at that. Okay. Um, now, where, like I said, it, it's, it's, it's called a mystery, right? A mystery is something that is hidden. So where is it that this harlot, this woman hid? Uh, it says in verses 15 through 18, uh, of Revelation 17. And he saith unto me, The waters which thou sawest, uh, where the whore sitteth, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Huh. Very interesting here. So this this woman um, was hidden in, in what it says is in the sea. Uh, but the sea was peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. And that's why I suggest that um, this Roman Empire, even though uh, it seems to have gone away hundreds of years ago, that it never really did go away. It just took a different form in order to hide among the people. And once again, there, I believe there's a connection here suggesting that, that it, it may be a religious organization. Um, and I, I once again, also, I don't want to really come right and say that because I don't want uh, people just to uh, be offended who don't know better. But I encourage everyone to search the scriptures. Come to a conclusion on your own. You know, allow the Lord to teach you. That's just something that, that I have found. Um, and uh, But once again, I, I'm not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that teaches us. God's work. All right. Um, but we will one day see this woman for what she is. John did, and he marveled. He marveled. It, it almost sounds like he had, I mean, it says he had admiration, but it just means that he was awestruck. Right? He, he, he was just boggled in his mind concerning this woman. You know, and, and which seems odd because think about all of the visions that he's already seen. You know, he's seen the, the Antichrist and the image of the Antichrist and the dragon who is Satan and the, the, uh, uh, the, the false prophet and all of these images. And 
It was his, the description of this woman, or at least what he saw concerning this woman, that really struck him here. That he, that he was awestruck concerning her. So we will one day see this woman or this figure, this organization, whatever it is, for what it is. And it's going to click. Everything's going to make sense uh, in, uh, according to what the scriptures say. And we're going to be like, oh, that's what he was talking about. Right? If the Lord wanted to, he would reveal it all to us right here and now. But, you know, we need to do the work. We need to make the effort to get into the scriptures, uh, see what it says, and, and make sure that we are prepared uh, to be able to see what the, the Lord allows us to see. You know, once again, I have my opinion on where in this whole situation the Lord is coming back. And, and it differs from a lot of people, but my prayer is that we, uh, we're up and out of here sooner rather than later for sure, but that I believe we truly need to be prepared uh, for whenever we may, whatever we may face during all of this time, okay? Obviously, um, you know, the Lord has not appointed us for wrath, so at the very least, I don't believe that we'll be here during the the emptying of the vials, um, but we have been promised that in this world we will see tribulation, and you know that doesn't necessarily mean the seven years, but but tribulation in general. We're going to see some bad things in this life. We're going to see some some really challenging things in this life, um, regardless of if it's during this time or not, and we need to be prepared for it, whatever may come. But here's the thing, and this is the most important part, according to verse 14, is the Lamb will get the victory. The Lamb will get the victory. Verse 14, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Um, it's very interesting that it, within the context of this entire chapter, there's only one verse that really speaks concerning his victory. You know, we, far more is said to describe the enemy and the en enemy's attempts to destroy God's people. But we know far more about the lamb from the rest of the entire Bible, right? It, we just read that, that he was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And you can find that, the evidence of that all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis. Right? And, a, and once again, that, that God did not have favor in uh, the attempts of Adam and Eve to be able to hide their own nakedness by the work of their own hands. Instead, innocent blood was shed to cover their sin. The image was already there from the very beginning, from the very moment that man sinned, that, that God already had a plan to, to cover our sinfulness. And that was with the innocent blood of Jesus Christ, that all the way back before the beginning, that that he uh, was already prepared with a sacrifice for our sins, right? And so all the way back to the book of Genesis, you find Jesus there. Every single book, you find him there. So we really don't need to see much. We've been waiting for this time. We've been waiting for the victory, you know? And, and even with all the things that have been going on you know, in our timeline that will come for us. But as far as with the uh, keeping in line with the, the timeline of the book of Revelation here, that they've now come to pass, even with all of that, it, it's not going to keep the Lord from keeping his promises. So not much needs to be said, but that the lamb shall overcome them and we with him, that he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings. The Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So simple as it may be, it's enough. It's enough. I mean, we saw God back in the book of Genesis create the entire world by the power of his voice. And by the power of his voice, he is going to defeat his enemies once and for all. That's pretty powerful. What really needs to be said in order for God to receive the victory? We've heard it said, I've read the end of the book, and we win. Well, here's the evidence of it. 
right? We still have some chapters to come, but really that's the carrying out of God's final judgment on, on his enemies and then the reward of his people uh, in the end. And uh, man, I'm looking forward to that. But as far as uh, the, the, you know, Satan's wrath on this earth, knowing that he has a little time, that his time is short, right? His, his opportunity has now come to an end with this verse. Right? These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. The end of the book says we win. Right? Um, it's not anything surprising. The victory has been assured from the foundation. But just in case we forget and and let's face it it's hard it's challenging seeing everything going ar on around us what is up with this year if if jesus is not coming back this year or very soon um man things are just crazy out there right and even in the midst of that even i have felt weighed down and heavy concerning uh, the things that are going on in our world and knowing the, the appropriate way to respond and looking for what's next, it's challenging. It's hard. It, 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 there's just a heaviness to it, right? You know, you've got, um, we're right in the middle of this pandemic. Um, you know, now the governor has said that we have to, that uh, churches need to shut down again, right? We, we shut down. We open back up and now he's saying that you have to shut down again. Um, you know, so we have to wrestle with that concept and that idea all the while making sure that we're doing what's necessary to stay safe. But then the world around us is just falling to pieces. L literally people are out in the streets destroying our country. And with very little um, retribution, with very little justice being done. You know, people are dying because they're sick of injustice. Well, innocent people dying doesn't uh, doesn't bring about justice, by the way. Things are just chaotic out there. And that weighs heavy on all of us. But you can imagine uh, the weight that a pastor holds on to with all that because we not only have ourselves and our families to be concerned about, we have a congregation of people and making sure that that uh, we're, we're in, the might, in the right mindset, spiritually speaking, uh, to be able to um, respond to these things, right? Now I've heard that there's a, a shortage of coins out there and it's just like, what else is gonna go on? You know, it's like, were there plagues in the scriptures that were promised to us this year that we didn't know about? You know, I, I don't know, it just all seems weird. But in the midst of all of it, we have to stop and remember that when it when it all ends, Jesus is going to be on the throne, just like he promised he would be, right? He made a covenant with David saying that I will be on your throne forever, that the throne of David will be forever through Jesus Christ. That still has to take place, but we are confident that it will take place. Why? Because... He has fulfilled every promise that he has ever made to us. It's just that these promises are for a time yet to come. Probably sooner rather than later, but a time yet to come. And so what do we need to do? And this is my final word. What do we need to do? How do we respond to this? Um, we need to uh, understand that Yes, things are going to get worse before they get better. You know, what we are seeing in our world right now has not even scratched the surface of what we're going to see once all of the things in the book of Revelation come about. So things are going to get worse. Right? Just like Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation. Well, tribulation is still coming. Right? But as he said, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And we know that he has overcome the world because 
of his blood, the shedding of his blood, and that, uh, but that he is not dead. He is risen, he is on the right hand of the Father, and he is returning very shortly, and he is going to, to uh, the, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Christ, right, as the scriptures say. They will become his. Uh, that doesn't mean that he won't be in control until then. He is in control. He is in control. Odd as it may seem, he is in control. Now, with that power and that sovereignty, it, it does mean that he allows things to happen according to his wisdom. We don't always understand all that. But this world deserves judgment. So really, uh, why, haven't, why hasn't the worst come yet? You know, the things that we're seeing now, you know, we deserve in a big way. The, the suffering and the persecution or the, uh, the, the challenges that this life is bringing, we deserve far worse than that. So why isn't it worse than, than it is? It's going to be. But God allows for those things to come about. Because in some way or another, God uses that in order to bring glory to his name and bring his will about. We need to constantly be in prayer, making sure that we ourselves are doing what he requires of us. Um, and just trusting that he knows what he's doing. And he does. may not make sense now, but it will make sense one day. One day he's going to put all things back in order. right? And that is what we hold on to. That is what we need to remember. So when we're feeling heavy and discouraged concerning the things that are going on, and even among God's people, we're disagreeing on certain things, we need to always make sure, which, you know, let's, let's face it, there's not a lot of clarity concerning a lot of this stuff. Nobody, nobody knows who's right or who's wrong on a lot of this. But we at least need to, even if we disagree, we need to love one another. And, and hear each other out concerning those things. And we need to hold on to the hope, right? That's, that's the main word in all of this is hope. And hope is not some, some whimsical idea. Hope is not a, like a wish or a dream, something that may or may not happen. No, hope is based on a promise. And our hope is based on the only one that has kept every promise he's ever made in the scriptures, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. So when the world around us is falling, we need to remember, as it says in verse 14, the lamb shall overcome, for he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. All right. Thank you. God bless you. I pray that, uh, that this has been a blessing to you as much as it is to me. Keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open. The Lord's coming is right around the corner. I truly believe that. Amen. God bless you.